and welcome to the third edition of this semester's joint Heidelberg Astronomical Colloquium. It is a special pleasure to welcome Selma de Mink. She talks about, you know, uh, social studies in astronomy, about couples and whether they stick together and eventually live happily as black holes. So we will learn about, uh, you know, binary stars and their potential tracks of evolution together or in separation. And um, before I do that, let me say a few words on, uh, let me introduce the speaker. Uh, she did study in uh, Utrecht, right? And then she uh, went to do a postdoc at the Argelander Institute in Bonn, I guess with Norbert Langer. And then she got a prestigious Hubble Fellowship, which she uh, spent, or which brought her to the uh, Space Telescope Science Institute in Baltimore. Then she continued with very prestigious fellowships because she got in combination Einstein and a uh, Spitzer Fellowship, which uh, she spent in Pasadena at the Carnegie Institution. Uh, then she got what is called a Marie Curie reintegration grant. Um, I guess reintegration into Europe and not into society. So which brought her to Amsterdam and since uh, 2014, she is now the Mac Gilvery assistant professor at the uh, Anton Panikuk Institute, which is part of the Universität von Amsterdam. And she is also holding a ESC grant on this topic. So let's welcome Selma. And let's look forward to a very nice talk. Thank you so much for, for letting me come. Uh, I came to visit here a few years ago. And it was an extremely welcoming visit. So it's very good to see a few people again. Uh, uh, I was excited to come here, actually. But then Americans kept me for one year longer. and. Uh, I'm sad I didn't spend more time in this institution, but uh, at the different institutions. Uh, I'm going to talk about uh, things that I'm excited about. And uh, I'm uh, talking to people. I'm, 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 I'm trying to aim my talk at those of you that think that uh, stars are not so interesting. So if you're here, maybe I don't have much to tell to you. Um, so my talk will consist of two parts. And the first part is a few general things that are exciting in the field of massive stars. And I realized actually one of these slides I showed four years ago already. So I, if you're, uh, but there's exciting things that are happening there that change how stars are, uh, how we think about massive stars and what they're doing and how we well we think they, we understand them. And I want to share that with you. And whether you're uh, 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 thinking about uh, stars that explode or cosmology or feedback or elements. If you're not interested in stellar evolution, these are the reasons to maybe worry about what's happening in our field. The second part of my talk is a bit disjunct. It's very specific stars that have a companion and that stay together for so long all the way until they are two black holes. And uh, of course, you have heard the developments there. I'm going to tell you about a crazy way to make 30 solar mass black holes and put it in perspective there, uh, which is something we worked on. Um, uh, I want to acknowledge the group we're growing there. It's amazing uh, people coming in. We have more positions, so if you're uh, at the postdoc or a PhD level, we're always looking for very good people to join. There's also a prize fellowships in, uh, in the Netherlands called the Veni Fellowship, and we can help you apply for that uh, if you're interested to work on this. And uh, there's several, many collaborators, especially the people here is people that I, uh, uh, I'm uh, grateful to. So I'm going to take you on the tour. Why, why would we discuss massive stars, right? So let me start from the cosmological picture of the history of our own universe. And so stars formed, massive stars formed from the first star zone. And from that moment, they played a major role as what you could call cosmic engines. So uh, they did all these crazy things. They were reionizing the universe, or at least contributing to it. People say galaxies ionize the universe, but it's obviously the stars in those galaxies, right? So let's, let's get the terminology right. Uh, they're enriching the universe in elements. All the oxygen you're breathing now today was made in some of these stars. Uh, at the same time, we use massive stars to look back uh, and we use them to probe the universe or the laws of physics that we're interested in. And so uh, in all these applications that I'm putting on here, we need stellar models either to interpret what we see and learn from it, or as recipes in our large-scale simulations. 
And I'm just talking about these stellar models and what is probably missing in there and what is more exciting in there. But it links to a wide range of topics, from explosions to, if we try to understand the highest redshift galaxies, the light we see, it is from the massive stars that are shining there. And if we try to understand what it means about the galaxy, its star formation rate, its composition, and the conditions under which it's formed, this plays a large role. And so we think today that these massive stars are not as simple as we thought for a long time. Uh, in many of these applications, stars are treated as nice, idealized objects single stars with nothing to disturb it. But it turns out the majority of these stars have a companion and do many other crazy things. So how does this complicate uh, all these roles that massive stars have? That is sort of the general theme of the things I'm interested in. And I'm going to just pick a few thoughts of that. So let's start with this. Uh, I'm going to talk a few uh, exciting results that were driven by the observations, but we also need a theoretical models to interpret what is happening uh, that, that for me are uh, uh, very exciting. I'm uh, from training uh, a theorist, but uh, the most interesting papers I think are observational papers uh, in my field. This is a region, um, we, we sometimes call it the Hubble Deep Field for stars because we break every record in this region. This is 30 Doradas, it's the closest that we have to uh, um, uh, starburst nearby. It's not a very strong starburst, but it's full of massive stars. It is in a large Magellanic cloud. Very nice. We, all these stars are by basically 50 kiloparsec. We know the distance. And so it's a very nice place to, to study stellar physics. And it has about a thousand young bright stars. And uh, it has been extremely hard in my field to get large data sets. Uh, having samples of a thousand is uh, <laughs> It's a breakthrough in my field. Imagine, this is what we call big data in, in, uh, in uh, massive star evolution. Uh, so we go from a few points in your diagram, like 10 points, suddenly we have a thousand stars that we can analyze. Uh, so one of the collaborations uh, that I work with is called the VLT Flame Survey of Massive Stars. And we took spectra of, of about 800 stars in there. 300 of them were O-type stars. O-type stars are stars with masses of 15 solar masses and above, and that's the ones that may make black holes, etc. Um, so this is a crazy region in the very center. That is a different survey because the center is so dense we could not observe that well from the ground. Is the star cluster R136, and you might have heard about these results. There are nine stars in there that are definitely over 100 solar masses, or well, definitely they, they seem to be over 100 solar masses. Uh, which in the press release was called monster stars. So let me show you a few of these. Uh, this diagram is an hertzsprung russell diagram. It's just showing how bright the stars are and what their temperature is in the wrong direction. So you probably have, are familiar with this. And so all these lines are lines for stellar models. This is a 200 solar mass star model. It's going all the way this direction. 100 solar masses, 60, 40, and 25. And these light blue lines are lines of constant uh, uh, ages. And so stars of, that are just born, uh, just started to burn hydrogen, they should lie on this line. There's several stars up here that are well above this 100 solar masses. And I don't know what you learned in stellar evolution class, but my evolutionary textbook set uh, had a very simple exercise. And you make some assumptions, and 100 solar mass was the maximum mass for a star. Uh, it has to do with radiation pressure, but there is a mistake in these, uh, in these estimates. Uh, there's as, as, asymptotic behavior. These stars get closer and closer to what we call the Eddington limit, but they approach it in a asymptotic behavior. And so there's no law forbidding these stars to exist. They, can be they will have strong winds. They're not going to stay that massive that long. But there's no law of nature that says this is the upper limit. And for a long time, in many of the uh, evolutionary models that are widely used, the models only went up to 100 solar masses. We had not seen any star with that mass and above that before. Uh, so this is very exciting. We can discuss whether we believe this or not. And there, there are discussions, but generally in my community, we think these are there. Uh, this nicely follows an IMF, so the, it, there's not suddenly a crazy jump there. Um, these few stars, if you forget to incorporate such massive stars, when you think of a stellar population at high redshift or nearby, these are the stars making such a large contribution to the UV budget of this star cluster. They're dominating the feedback at this moment, at least. They're going to die soon, right? Over time, the other stars will pick over. But if you catch them that young, that's the stars that, uh, that we see the light from. Um, this is funny. These stars, most of them are single, which is very weird for massive stars. 
already hinted at that. Down here, they're all binaries. But these are single, so this may be telling very interesting things on how these stars form, but uh, maybe we have uh, experts here in the room that can uh, think about that better. Um, we break every record there. One of the things that stars do is they are rotating and sometimes extremely fast. And so in this region, we see anything from stars that are basically not rotating to rotating a bit. That, that holds for most of them. But once in a while, we see these crazy outliers. This is a particular one. Uh, this star is rotating so fast that its equator is spinning at almost 600 kilometers a second. And that is basically the Keplerian speed. And so what is happening with these stars is that the material on the outer layers is, uh, is uh, close to being unbound and it can be launched into a disk around the star. And we see the emission of this disk. And this is the artist's impression. Obviously, we don't see it. We don't know if that's uh, such a nice uh, thin disk. Um, but we see these crazily fast rotating stars. Our models were not accounting for rotation for a long time, or the, or the, the widely used models. The Geneva group is one of the groups that has been really pushing to understand what it does to a star. So this star is no longer nicely round, it's a bit flat. Its pole is going to be hotter than its equator. And so strange things can happen inside these stars. You can have large scale circulations going from the center to the core and back, addict and sweet circulations. That was known for a long time, but it was not uh, what was implemented in the widely used models. And so there's crazy things that can happen, at least if you believe the theoretical predictions. Uh, and so let me show you in this diagram, same diagram, so the Hedgeprung-Russell diagram. I'm showing you, uh, again, evolutionary tracks. Uh, 16 solar masses, 20, 30, 40, and 60. And this is for rather metal poor stars. This is for non-rotating stars. And so a uh, very basic fact of stellar evolution is that stars want to expand, right? We know the sun is going to become a, a red giant someday. And that will be bad for us. And so all these stars expand. The core contracts, the envelope expands. There's nothing you can do about it, I thought. Uh, but this very rotation drives these strange circulations that can grab material from the center to the core, and it really changes the structure. And so this is what happens in the models with very fast rotation. This is something that uh, was originally pointed out by uh, André Meder already in 89, uh, that this could happen for very fast rotating stars. I saw the first uh, diagrams of that made by uh, Sung Chul Yoon in 2005, which is uh, uh, early start of my uh, PhD. And for me, this was the motivation to, uh, to really keep thinking about massive star evolution. These, these stars just go in the wrong direction in the diagram up from what my evolutionary textbook was saying, right? Um, there's big debates whether this is actually happening or not. Uh, these are very fast rotating stars here. I can, uh, I lost part of my, oh yeah. Oh, that's very weak. These are uh, rotating at uh, 550 kilometers a second. So it's not that e half of the stars should go left and half of the stars should go right. No, there's very few of those. And the other thing I didn't tell you is that this is actually for relatively mo low metallicity. This is what we think should mi might be happening in the SMC or less. This is very exciting. These stars have crazy temperatures. Look at it, uh, 80,000, 10,000 degrees. Uh, there's still an atmosphere on top, but uh, Whatever these stars are going to do, they're going to make so much ionizing radiation. They're going to dominate uh, strange emission lines from, uh, from uh, galaxies that uh, might have these. Mm, that is not what I wanted. I better not touch that. That's rotation. Um, uh, we're very excited about that for ionizing photons, but also because we think these stars are so fast spinning that at the moment they explode, they have so much angular momentum that if you form a Newton star or black hole inside, that the material around it can stay spinning in a Keplerian disk around it and you can launch jets. And it's one of the ideas that might be behind long gamma ray bursts. Uh, but that will be a different story. Then this region is full of binaries, and I'm, I'm going to go back to that. But binaries can change the lives of stars in many ways. Um, uh, but I'm going to skip that short for the moment. Uh, let's first talk about one of the things that binaries can make, that is stars that run away. Um, um, there is one star on the edge of this diagram. It's one of these bright ones. I think my arrow is a little bit off. It is a star that is 80 times the mass of the sun, 8, 0, uh, one of the extremely massive stars, and it is moving towards us with a little over 30 kilometers a second. And so it's running away. 
Um, at least we know the motion towards us. We don't know in which direction it is uh, moving yet. Um, the background is in part an HST image to get the proper motion. And so one of the questions is, is that 80 Soloma star shot out of that central star cluster? Uh, that is a possibility. One of the ways to make such stars that you shoot out is that there is three stars, two in a binary system that encounter a third star, that find each other, become in a chaotic situation, do a little dance until one of them flies out with a, a faster velocity than the one is coming in and the binary shrinks. That's where the energy is coming from. And so the hypothesis that this 80 Soloma star was flung out of the center. And so what we're trying to do is to try to get the proper motion. Now that is tough. This, this is the LMC, right? Uh, in principle, it should be possible with HST, uh, but it's just one star and it's so bright that uh, we took data, but it's actually too overexposed. So it's, it's been a tough challenge. Uh, we'll see uh, uh, Gaia should uh, catch some of these stars and maybe this one is, uh, is actually doable for Gaia, but I don't know that for sure. This is not the only way to shoot out stars. And there's another way to shoot out stars. If stars are in a binary system, and one dies and explodes, then you can unbind the system. If during the explosion you would lo lose half the mass of the system, it's no longer bound. Now that never happens because the star that explodes already has given all its mass to the other star. Uh, but they still unbind and that's because we think compact objects, neutron stars and black holes are formed with birth kicks. And so the majority of these systems at the moment the explosion takes place, this birth kick usually disrupts the system. Almost in all cases, with a few exceptions, obviously, because we would love some of these Newton stars to stay in a binary system, or black holes to stay in a binary system, and you know that will be the second part of my talk. Then there's one binary, not every binary is equal. This is a crazy binary system. Uh, this is, uh, oh, I forgot that it's a phone number. This is a paper from Leonardo Almeida that fell off my slide. No, oh, it's here. Uh, this is a binary system, this is an artist impression obviously, uh, but this is one of the binaries in this field and it's two stars of 30 solar masses. Uh, within arrow bars they're the same mass, the arrow bars are two or three solar masses. And they orbit around each other basically each day and these stars are so close to each other from the light curve and from the measurements of the spectral measurements we know that they're sharing 20% of their volume. And so that looks amazing, we think it looks like this. Well, at least the artists at ESO uh, press office think it looks like this. Um, so what you see is just the shape of the rush lobe that we, these stars are filling. What is, might not be real is that they overlay this solar flares on top of this uh, star, which makes it look awesome. Uh, but uh, it's not clear whether that's actually uh, uh, the case. I think you can see the magnetic uh, sunspots and we don't really think that that's happening. But uh, imagine flying by uh, these systems. This will come. Uh, come back. Um, so I want to talk a little bit more about this binarity. Um, so there's many things we can discuss of the things I just told you. We can debate whether these stars really are 300 solar masses or not. That, that is debatable. We, we think they're there but there are arguments that maybe we were, that, that this is not the last word about. We know stars are rotating but are they really going in the wrong direction? That is debated. But there's one thing that's not debated is that basically all these stars have companions and they're very nearby. And so this is a picture of what these stars would be doing. Uh, a more massive star and a less massive star that are interacting and sharing mass. And so we used to think that this is a picture of something very exotic. <laughs> Exciting, interesting physics is not new. We were thinking about this, but really thought this was, uh, was uh, something very rare. And it's not. This is what the majority of stars go through in their lives, is what we think at the moment. Massive stars. Um, and so this is a statement that comes from data. And I'll show you a little bit. This is uh, uh, data that uh, we obtained in the decade before 2012 and that uh, made a very big uh, impact wider in the community. But nobody in the massive star community was too surprised about this result. We showed that there's very high fraction of binaries and they were like, ah, oh, we know that. Uh, but but um, so this is a sample of stars that are O stars, there's 15 solar masses and above, and they, we took them from very young clusters, clusters with star clusters with ages of less than four million years, zero and four. That is very young for a massive star. So stars didn't have much time to swell up 
uh, and evolve. And so we hope this is as close as we can get to what we think is what we call the initial conditions. Initial being, <laughs> I guess for some people in this room, this will be the end conditions of their uh, star formation simulations. For, for us, this is our starting point, right? So what I'm showing you is the period of these systems, uh, ranging from one day, 10 day, 100 day, and 1,000 days. And uh, this is very close to, to give you a perspective, an O-star. Um, if you think of an O-star when it's young, and you would think of it as the size of an orange, maybe I should have brought one, the size of an orange, this O-star is going to swell up over its life. At the end of its life, it's going to be a red supergiant. And in most places where I do that, this lecture room is too big to make an impact. And usually it's until the ceiling, but this lecture room is big. So it's sort of one eighth of this, uh, of this lecture room. It's less impressive here. Um, um, so if you think of a, of a binary like that, of an O star like that, then 30% of these O stars have a companion at, to scale basically this separation between here and here. Uh, 30%. And that means they're so close that the two stars will interact and do crazy things when they're just on the main sequence, which is a very, the most boring hydrogen burning phase. And so they really change their evolution already so early in their evolution and that will impact all the later phases. In seven out of ten cases, this companion would be between here and uh, maybe, maybe a third of, of the height of this lecture hall. Meaning it will interact like I showed you in the previous picture. Um, this is the data uh, of this initial uh, uh, survey, and so it's a commutative distribution. You see it's steep here. Each of these is a binary system, and so it's just uh, going up by, uh, by number. And you see there's many here, and then it flattens off. And in part, it's a selection effect because it's much harder to find these white binaries. Um, but it's not only selection effect. There's really a preference for, for these short period systems. And so for this sample, we could work out how many we missed, which I will not go into. What I wanted to go into is the newer developments that happened since 2012. The question many people ask is, is the initial mass function universal? Right? This, what is the initial mass function is the function, is the distribution of how many massive stars do we form compared to how many low mass stars we form. One of the big debates is if we go back in time towards the earlier universe or different galaxies, is that distribution function the same? As soon as all these stars are in binary, you should ask a different question. Is, are, these binary, are these binary properties universal? For me, that's an important question because I would like to populate the whole universe with binaries and predict how many black holes they make, and I would like to know what distribution functions to put in. Um, I'm not able to answer that question, but we have many more data. We have two more data sets now that are appeared afterwards. This is a data set that is much larger, uh, analyzed by Kubernicki and collaborators. It's larger because they also included early B-type stars, so it's a bit lower mass. And it's also larger because it also has slightly older stars. And so you do see differences if you want to. Uh, but given that it's a bit lower mass and a bit older, uh, these are small effects. These are not statistically significantly uh, different uh, distributions. Uh, this is the third survey that we just had out. It's coming from the same picture I showed you early in the background, this 30 Dorada survey. Only O stars, and now we had 300 O stars, and 100 of them were binaries. And so we now we have 100, 100 points in this diagram. To all we can say today, we don't have any evidence for deviation from universality of the binary properties. There's, there's no way I can prove that the early universe was like this, but this is pretty different regions. This is uh, pretty loose clusters in our galaxy. Or I would, it's better to say associations. Uh, it's just collections of stars. They're not even bound. They don't have much dynamical interaction. Uh, this 30 Doradus region is a lot denser, and there's a lot more feedback during the star formation. It's mostly the, the region. It's not the super dense star cluster, but uh, uh, it is a slightly lower metallicity. But uh, anyway. That's what I wanted to say. And just for reference, this is what I was trying to do with this orange. And so if they're less than six day period, that's these binaries being so close that they interact during the main sequence, and being up to 1,500 days, they have very severe interaction before they die. The other ones will also interact, but you cannot strip off too much anymore. And so that leads to this picture. Uh, this is from the original results of 2012. The percentages, we, they are not, uh, um, they may change by 10, 10 or 15 percent, but uh, about one third of the star lives its life as an actual single star. It probably has a companion, but the 
companion is not messing up its life too much. And uh, the rest of these do all kind of crazy things. Uh, you might strip the envelope of a star in yellow, so one star losing its envelope, leaving a very hot core, which is interesting, makes hot ionizing photons. You can accrete mass, spin up, and stars can get in contact and merge. And so, to be honest, this, the boundaries in all this the colored part of the pie chart, uh, they're uncertain. That depends on the stellar evolution models. How many stars merge could be a lot more. That depends on, on interesting things that have to do with what happens if mass transfer from one star to the other. Um, but the, the errors between the 30% and the part that interacts, we see that fraction to be the interacting fraction is 70% in the first survey and over 50% in the other survey. So the majority of massive stars go through this. And so this makes the life of stars interesting and complicated. Um, this is the evolutionary track, as you might be familiar to, of a 15 solar mass star uh, computed by my student Ilva Gutberg. And this is the one that would be single, so you see it expanding. In color you see how much the helium there is in the center. But it just looks pretty. So you see helium changing, right? It's, it's, making, uh, it's burning hydrogen into helium, expanding and then exploding as a red supergiant or if you're into this nomenclature, a type 2 supernova. Um, this would happen when it would be in a binary system. The first part is the same. It evolves as a single star and then it transfers mass and very quickly it goes through a strange phase in which it dips in luminosity for a moment. So you peel off these outer layers and the star has to respond to it and it has to expand to its new equilibrium structure and it, using the photons for it. So for a moment it's not uh, very bright. And then it has lost so much mass that it contracts, becomes very hot. And this is a very interesting source of uh, ionizing photons at very late stages. So that's a paper from Gutberg et al. That's, that is uh, out on SWH now, that's an old slide. And then they swell up and this star becomes a funny giant, a helium giant, and that would explode as a helium-rich supernova. And if you didn't like that in a diagram, I can show you the same model, but animated as a movie. It's almost the same model. Uh, so this would be two stars. So the, the thing I want to sink in, that's what you're going to see now is the normal way for a star to evolve. There's variations a little bit, but uh, this is a very standard case. So this, one of these stars was 20 solar masses and it's slowly growing. And uh, you can see in tiny numbers, they're probably too small to see. It's losing a little bit of mass because it has a stellar wind. And so this star is swelling up and now it starts to transfer mass to the other star, more slope overflow. Yeah, I should say it's a one dimensional model, we just visualized it in 3D, but uh, uh, we start to compete with all the amazing movies that other people make, right? Uh, so now it's transferring mass. I don't know if you can see, but it's now 17 solar masses dropping to 16 and it will go on all the way until its helium core is exposed. It's eight solar masses, seven, six, and five solar masses. It's five solar masses now and it's almost pure helium. It contracts. This is a very hot star. Uh, that's the one I showed you in the diagram before and now it will swell up to become a helium giant and explode. And so this is very sad. It was a very happy couple of stars, but it broke up this system and now this, this widow star is flying out there by itself as a runaway star or walkaway star and it dies maybe a kiloparsec away from its birth. It can be at quite a distance. And that one will explode as a, as a type 2 supernova. And if you were paying attention, uh, there's a big mistake at the end of this movie. So you see this, this, this big giant exploding. It should just explode and the picture shows it imploding, which is not what's happening. But you were not worried about that. Uh, let's not uh, worry about that part. Uh, how am I doing on time? Yes, okay. Okay, let's go to, uh, so this is a bit of a break, but of course these things connect, right? So, so we went from binary stars, the normal boring way that stars are in binaries and what do they do and are, are they important for feedback to this tiny, tiny minority that does crazy things and makes two black holes that we can see. Uh, but it's the same physics that should explain both. And so for me it's a lot of fun to think about these two things at the same time. Um, so you've heard about this, right? Um, uh, what time? It took almost two years ago already now uh, this happened. Uh, LIGO detected gravitational waves. And so in a galaxy far away, like 1.4 billion light years away, uh, apparently there are two black holes of 30 solar masses going around each other 
And by doing so, they curved space-time and they spiraled into each other. And the signature of that was deforming space-time in a way that was traveling outwards. And it's with the speed of light, this signal arrived at Earth. And then in September 2015, already, am I off? Yeah, 2015, this signal arrived at Earth and all of us were suddenly stretched and squeezed by such a tiny amount that no one of us noticed. Uh, but the LIGO detector was measuring, uh, which is basically a super advanced interferometer, and it could measure the stretching and squeezing of the signal arriving. And so what you see in this diagram is the strain that was measured. And what you see is uh, a sinus signal, which is going uh, stronger and stronger, and that is this binary system in spiraling uh, and getting closer and closer. There's a very nice uh, archive paper that is uh, lovely to read. If you just take Kepler's law with high school mathematics, you can already get a very long way in, in estimating what system was merging here just by looking at the periods, so, uh, uh, which is fun uh, to think about. And so this signal arrived uh, slightly earlier uh, at uh, uh, one side of the US than on the other side of the US because light takes time to go from one side to the other side of the US, not much. But if you shift these signals and over plot them, uh, they very nicely lie on top of each other. And so, um, uh, this is changing a lot. If you're not following this field, <laughs> this is for my public talk actually, but I, I thought I'd put it in. So, uh, this is, that, that was the first detection of really measuring phenomena in space in a completely different way that we have been doing so far, right? So, uh, most of us, we think about photons arriving at Earth and thinking about the spectrum. Uh, so, that's the way we would see a uh, different spectrum, but we suddenly open up uh, a window to the gravitational wave spectrum. And we, we've only measuring a very small part or very small color, if you want, of this gravitational wave spectrum. Uh, that's because the length of the ground-based uh, interferometers is a certain length. They're only sensitive to, uh, to uh, specific frequencies. But if we uh, 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 build such interferometers in space and make them much larger, we can measure longer wavelengths. And we will not only to be able to detect uh, stellar mass black holes, but also supermassive black holes. And so there may be many phenomena that are uh, making noise, if you want, in this part of the spectrum that we're going to uh, observe. And certainly there's enough money to build these detectors now. Uh, uh, LIGO has been uh, doing that. And so I think this is also good to point out. People were really, uh, people were uh, relatively optimistic that we were part of this and we would detect something. Uh, but, uh, well, first of all, everyone would have put their money on it being a neutron star, two neutron stars merging. Why? Because we know about double neutron stars. We know they exist. We see several in our galaxy, right? Double pulsars. Um, we have never seen two black holes going around each other, at least, at least not stellar mass black holes. And I don't think that holds for supermassive black holes too, but uh, <laughs> I'm not fully sure there. Um, secondly, we thought this signal would be detectable if that would happen close enough, but we thought we knew, would need this extreme machine learning uh, pattern searching techniques to find this in the signal. And so the, the, my public talk version is this, you are at this party and there's all this noise out of the universe and there's trucks passing by and there's earthquakes and there's vibration modes in the mirrors hanging on strings so they have these violin modes. And so there's all this noise and out of that noise you are hoping to hear, hear what this black hole is saying in the other side of the room. Um, and, but this was more like the way it was. It was really shouting at it. The data I showed you before, you can see the signal with your eyes. You don't have to do data processing to think it's in there. And so uh, I was at the press conference in, in Amsterdam, which was our local, uh, where the NICAF is partially involved in the Virgo um, uh, experiment, which was uh, not as sensitive, not doing too well, I believe. Um, but the big thing for me is that you could see it by eye. We had heard the rumors on Twitter, right? So we, we, we had an idea that it was coming. And we got some time to adapt, but that you can actually see the signal that was crazy. So why did we in stellar physics go wild over this? So we knew about black holes in, in stellar mass black holes. And to put that in perspective, these are the black holes that we knew about by X-ray studies, meaning X-ray binaries. Right, so one black hole that's being fed by another star and you can find that in Chandra or other X-ray instruments. And so this is a diagram also from the um, uh, public outreach material from the LIGO site. And so each of these is one of the black holes we knew about 
uh, just as a function of number. And most of these black holes were between 5 and 10 solar masses. They have big error bars that are not shown here, but um, all the b uh, black holes that were 10 to 15, they have very big error bars. They could also be in this regime. And there's some error bars approaching 20 and upwards. We didn't know that there was black holes more massive than this. But this is the ones in our galaxy. And to put in perspective, the first event by LIGO was this one, right? And so it's really probing a new part of the mass spectrum. We didn't even know that stars would leave such objects. And you can also find relatively wild papers that maybe these black holes didn't come from stars, but from a primordial fluctuation in the universe that collapsed and made black holes. And somehow all the microlensing experiments were blind to these ones, uh, which is, uh, people are excited about this. But uh, when we go back to our models, actually, it was pretty easy to make 30 solar mass black holes. You just need to do this in a star that is not in our own galaxy, but in a more metal poor galaxy. And it was an evolutionary prediction, but now we see them. And so these were two 30 solar mass black holes, roughly, and they merged together to form a new black hole. Uh, and at that moment, three solar masses worth of energy was radiated away. And so at that moment, this was the most uh, luminous event in terms of energy per second of the entire visible universe together, which is a crazy number. It's not the only black hole. There's a second one detected. Which is, that would have been less exciting if that would be the first one to be detected, right? This, this completely falls in the right uh, regime. Uh, I think for many people, having that one afterwards is actually helping to... People were thinking that the first one was maybe that the machine, the pipeline was hacked and people did a fake signal in that from outside. They actually check for this. Uh, there's a third one that is uh, officially to their standards not enough significance to be called a detection. Um, uh, but it has an over 80% chance to be real. And, you know, we're astrophysicists. We just try to model this one like the other one. If it would be an outlier, I think we would be skeptical. But it's, uh, uh, there should be more detections, and we'll hear more soon. The second run has been uh, going on. Um, there's more triggers, at least. Whether it's actual detections, I don't know. Um, so uh, I should speed up a bit. So the, the question that I'm interested in, where did these black holes formed and what can we learn from that about stellar physics or maybe about the location where they formed. So if we go back here, um, if they are from stellar origin, they could, the, the, this black hole merged in a galaxy that was at low redshift nearby. Uh, but it doesn't mean that the stars lived uh, at low redshift. They were probably formed at higher redshift lived their lives, exploded, made two black holes, and these black holes probably take giga years to circle around each other until they merge basically next door. Next door. Uh, but they, they really probe a different time uh, in our universe than we are uh, today. And, and then there's a second idea that these come from primordial fluctuations, but I won't talk about that. So how do you get two black holes so close that these black holes uh, lose so much angular momentum and gravitational waves that they actually spiral in? I mean, any two black holes you put around would, would slowly spiral in, but you, it would be nice if that happens within the age of the universe, right, if you want to see it. So, and that means that you have to put these black holes at a distance that is maybe 30 times the radius of the sun. Sort of, I forgot, what is the orbit of Mercury? It's, it must be something like sun-Mercury-ish orbit. How do you get two black holes at that separation if the stars that you made them from were as big as... Uh, a uh, big size of this lecture room, right? And so this is, this is sort of the two challenges in how to understand how you get these two black holes to form in such a system. As so we have been simplifying this, this, this challenges a bit in sort of the challenge of separation. How do you get them so close? And at the same time, the mass challenge. How do you still get them 30 solar masses? And I'll try to show you that, that those, these two things are in conflict, right? So we need them maybe 10 solar radius apart, or 20 or 30, but in that ballpark. And so this is again the origins at the, at the right scale at birth, but the problem is these stars become the size of the room, right? And I'm cheating here because you may notice the center of mass of that star suddenly moved to sort of down there. Uh, that's not supposed to happen. So that star would completely engulf the companion. So that is the challenge of separation. How do we get them close without one of these stars tripping off all that mass and you have nothing left to make a black hole? Um, and so this is the main ingredient in the different ideas of how these black holes form. How do we overcome these two challenges? And there's different ways to overcome that. And the two, I'm going to do really briefly the two main channels. And then 
propose something slightly wilder, but it's being discussed in the literature now. Um, so we could sort of think of things that stars do during their life because of how they evolve, or things that have to do with the dynamics of a star cluster. And so the first one, I, I'm putting, uh, where are you? Putting your diagram there. I know this was not a simulation uh, for binary black holes, but this is a simulation for something that we call common envelope evolution. And so the trick, the solution in uh, this scenario is that you start with two stars, and so the solution to the separation and mass problem is that you start very far apart. And you let the stars live their lives almost undisturbed for most of their life without stripping mass from each other. And so they form very heavy cores. And then only at the last moment, when one of these stars is very big, it engulfs the other star, uh, so, which already formed the black hole. It engulfs the black hole. And then this black hole spirals in through this envelope, brings them closer together. And then the core of this one implodes, makes a second black hole. So it circumvents the mass problem by staying apart for as long as you can. And then it circumvents the separation problem by at the last moment using the common envelope to spiral in and closer to each other. And uh, yeah, so this simulation is not for such systems, it's for lower masses, but it's one of the beautiful simulations that's done here. And it's the best pictures I can find today. So that's super quick on it. The second way to do it is something dynamical. And this is a simulation from uh, Carlo Rodriguez. It's the same way you make a runaway. See if that's better. This is the same way you make a runaway star. So you have a binary system. Uh, that, that was the two red stars that encounter a single star. And this, this probably happens in a star cluster, right? Otherwise, the chance would be very small. And so this does a very chaotic dance. It's not going to last forever. So at this moment, it shot out one star with a higher velocity. And this uh, binary has shrunk and is going in the other direction. And so you can do this a few times in a dense star cluster and pair the black holes in ever, ever tighter binaries. But the problem is you can also see already this binary went off the screen. Uh, that's also happening in clusters. As each time you do something like this, uh, one star gets kicked out, but the binary also gets a kick. And this kick is getting stronger and stronger with each interaction. Each time you want to shrink it further, the kick also will be larger. And so there's a maximum number of times you can do this interaction before you shoot out the binary of the cluster. And then it's flying through space, and there's no way anything is going to help it shrink further. And so this sets a limit to this scenario. Only the most massive stars, only the most massive clusters can, are massive enough to, for, for these uh, binaries to shrink enough and, uh, and do this. And then this uh, two black hole binary flies out of this cluster, and somewhere out in space it will merge and make a gravitational wave. So as many people that worked on this. So there's one uh, um, wilder idea uh, that is something I worked on in my PhD thesis. And uh, honestly, it was in the discussion section of a paper uh, where we thought this is crazy, but it's so much fun. Uh, this is probably not true, but it's exciting. I'm, I'm going to tell it. And uh, it's, rem uh, it's almost uh, remarkable. It's being discussed seriously now. And I still don't know if we're wasting people's time or if this is. Uh, uh, a good thing. But, but the idea behind it is very fun and it has to do with the first part of the talk. So I'm going to tell you about it. It has to do with this system. Right? And so I told you that rotating stars have these strange internal circulations. That should also be true in this star because these stars are deformed. And the reason these circulations are there is because they're no longer spherical. The equipotential surfaces don't have the same temperature. And so these two stars should also have these strange circulations inside. And so if you believe the model predictions, which you shouldn't maybe, or you should be skeptical, but if you believe them, then these circulations can help the star to bring all the helium throughout the envelope, mix it through. And so in normal stars would form a core and an envelope and expand because of that. These stars convert entirely into helium. If you mix, then they convert entirely into helium. Helium, if you convert from four protons, from hydrogen to helium, it's four protons you need to make helium. Four protons take more space than helium. A star that's fully made out of helium is much more compact. It's not just going from four particles to one. It's, it's also the opacity that goes in here. But I, so, um, so the, the idea is that, let me put it in this uh, 
uh, this is the diagrams we, we made at that time. If you had a star that's hydrogen rich, a normal star would expand. It would have a core, a helium core and hydrogen envelope. And it's this transition in chemical composition, which is uh, making this part contract and this part extend. And you can write a read a million papers of why that actually is happening. But it's just a hydrostatic uh, solution for the star. Now, if we mix the star completely through, the whole star is like the core. And so this star would shrink and get more and more compact. And so this is very exciting to think about, because if both these stars will do this, maybe not particularly the system that we observed here, but a, more, a slightly more extreme system in a more metal poor galaxy, then these two stars could do this, they could shrink, and they would detach. There will be two detached helium stars, very massive. The typical mass will be 40 or 50 solar masses at that point, uh, and they would lose a little bit of mass through winds. Maybe the system would widen a little bit, but these stars will not be able to explode. Eventually, their core collapses on their own weight, and we don't think they have enough energy to make a greatly bright supernova. Uh, we think these stars implode and make uh, 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 massive black holes. So the interesting thing about this, this is a very different way to solve the mass budget, the mass and the separation problem I told you about, right? So in the classic scenario, you put these stars as far apart as you can, and at the last moment, you bring them together. Here, we put the stars exactly at 10 solar radii apart. They are at the right distance if these will convert into black holes to later shrink. So that is a beautiful natural thing that comes out of this. And so the solution to the mass problem here is that these stars don't strip each other. They mix each other through, and they make much more massive cores that they very naturally lead to massive black holes. Um, so this is being discussed, the interesting is that if you try to simulate this, with we're doing this relatively approximate now, you get an, uh, predictions for how far would these black holes be apart, and it's, uh, it's a rough uh, distribution of separations, and you can convert how long does it take for these things to merge. And it's, uh, it's a broad, oops. It's a broad function, but whatever you do, you naturally write in the regime for things to merge within Hubble time, so it's a few million year, few uh, giga years. The second thing that is really exciting about this is uh, the masses you get out of this. Um, so typically, these two black holes will be comparable mass. Not necessarily exactly the same mass, but comparable. Uh, so uh, on this axis, I show you the distribution of mass ratios for these events from the simplified simulation that we did here, and how massive these systems would be. And I overplotted the first event. So this, oh, we're pretty proud to get that close. And the, the honest version is that uh, we did this a year before uh, LIGO did the detection, and I was a postdoc at uh, Carnegie and Caltech, and we were discussing, I told this crazy story, and uh, we discussed that it would make massive black holes. And Ilya Mandel said to me, well, <laughs> I don't believe it, but if it's uh, true, then LIGO should uh, find massive pairs of black holes. And so we didn't take this paper too seriously. We, we realized it would be wise to write this up, but more, what if? A type of story. So these simulations were lying on my hard drive, and I was uh, going to Amsterdam, and we were not rushing anything. And then uh, Twitter basically <laughs> announced that there was something happening, and we realized we had to hurry up. Uh, so in the end, it's not a prediction, but a postdiction, because we did the last bits after uh, uh, things were known. And I should say, uh, I didn't know anything except for, for Twitter. Ilya Mandel was inside the collaboration, so he. Uh, uh, all the work we did here to uh, convolve with the LIGO uh, detection efficiency is, uh, is from his, his side, and he's the one that motivated me to do, to do this. He knew, he didn't tell me anything, I didn't. That's an interesting way to write a paper, I can say. <laughs> I don't recommend it. Uh, but it's been exciting. Um, and so the fun part, I'm gonna uh, uh, wrap up this part and then wrap up the full talk. So it's a wild idea on the one hand, um, but it's not any other wilder than the other scenarios out there. Uh, it, it is competitive in terms of rates with the other scenarios. Although they are uncertain, but it's, it's easy to get the right rates. Uh, you naturally get the high masses and equal comparable mass components that we saw in the first event. Uh, we think we can also explain the spins, but people are debating this at the moment. Um, if I need to sell it, we need to understand how these mixing processes work, and it's complicated, and you might not believe the cartoon picture I, I showed you there, but on the other hand, it's very simple. If the star mix, mixes, then it does this. 
The question is, are they, these hydrodynamical processes able to really uh, uh, do this? We see a few observed systems that seem to be on the way to do this, and they will not go all the way, but they are too hot and too uh, compact that we can explain with our models. There are hints that this might be happening, at least not violating this scenario, uh, but it's not uh, strong proof. Um, uh, for this event, it's hard to distinguish which channel did it. Um, the dynamics channel has trouble to, uh, to make the low mass events. This channel also has trouble to make the low mass events. So at the moment, we'll be debating uh, uh, what's happening there. Uh, it will be exciting uh, things uh, that were happening. Uh, I'm going to conclude here. So I basically gave two separate talks almost, but both had the theme of binaries. But I briefly want to go back to this, right? So. I'm, I'm going to quote uh, you, Volker, of our discussion. I was visiting you yesterday, and I hope you forgive me. Uh, <laughs> but you're not the only one who said this to me. <laughs> this, was used, this, used to be, this used to be the, uh, I put your initials, because I wasn't sure whether you would appreciate this. Uh, uh, this used to be many people thinking this way. And uh, uh, a few years ago, before we had this result with Uxana, people outside the binary community were very skeptical and think that what, what exciting things can stars do. But these are different times, right? And not just the things I talked to you about. I, this is very biased view of massive star evolution that I'm excited about. But there's Gaia is going to change uh, um, uh, things. There's the transient surveys coming up. This is crazy exciting time. So if you're doing cosmology, you should come to our field and help us out because I think uh, we have interesting problems for you to work on. Um, so I talked to you that stars are not limited to 100 solar masses. I think you, some of you got a hint in, in previous already. And, and so I'm, I'm really excited that you guys are doing mergers and common envelope simulations, in, uh, uh, especially Sebastian here. I talked about runaway stars, spinning stars. I talked about crazy dynamics and near collisions between stars, shooting out stars that will travel out of the galaxy and uh, impact what they do to their galaxy and, and, and the enrichment of it uh, in different ways than when they would just stay at home, right? Um, although they are single by that time, so in terms of the marriage, this is not the best uh, option. And we have these crazy contact stars. Um, and the second part, I just had a visual. Uh, I think the interesting question is how the heck did we make two 30 solar mass black holes? Uh, I'm having fun with this scenario. I'm not. I'm not even putting my money on it, but it will be interesting to see what are the side predictions of this crazy homogeneous scenario, right? If some of these stars make these black holes, then some of them will also fail to do so. And can we see all those side products? And so especially Pablo Marchand has, uh, is uh, uh, now postdoc at Northwestern, who has really taken the lead of simulating this. And uh, is trying to predict, uh, we're trying to uh, work out um, what happens if only one of these stars goes homogeneous. You get ultra-luminous X-ray sources. Uh, it has predictions for the number of pair instability supernova that go off. So we can test this, and that's what we're working on. And so that's definitely an area where we need computing power and uh, observations to, uh, to go together. And then if you sort of lost track of me halfway, I want to take away one thing. I know the black hole parts are exciting. But actually, I wanna, if you take one thing away, I want to take I would like you to take away the boring part of this talk. What is the average star doing, the common normal star? And that's actually not a boring story. That's the majority, we think, of massive stars go through phases like that. And so the bigger question is, how is that affecting all the things we thought stars are responsible for? And maybe in some cases, the effects are not so big, because most of their life, they are still just going around each other, and this interaction phase is short. For other effects, it will be very large. You don't have your envelopes around. The way your explosions and light curves look like will be very different. Um, that's what I uh, wanted to finish with. Uh, thank you very much. So thanks again for this very exciting overview of binary evolution and what it can affect in terms of galaxy evolution, ISM dynamic star formation. Was very great talk. Um, so, questions. Who wants to start? Yes, please. Wait, wait. My main question is about this massive binary system. How do we know they were not? They were born as binary system, but not captured later on. You mean when there's this, the stellar binary system, not the black holes, right? Yeah, just the, the massive binary system you showed. Uh, we 
we should maybe discuss what, how do we define that the stars are born? Because the uh, question, the two of us might have a different answer to this question. I would start at the moment they start burning hydrogen, and we see them within half a million years after that, and at that moment they're very close. But the question is, was there a cloud that magically made two binary stars? Probably not. We think that these stars were much bigger in the process of being formed, much bigger than the whole system is today. And so I was trying to make this point that these stars are too close and they will swell up later, but I could have uh, put the clock backwards and say they're so close, but they used to be this big. How the heck did they get this big? Uh, we don't know the answer. Uh, there's uh, two directions of thoughts, but I guess maybe uh, you should ask other people as well. Uh, one of them is that they might migrate inwards in, in the disk of one of these stars, a bit like planets could migrate inwards. The second thought is that these two stars go around each other, but there's a third star that is uh, inducing uh, cosi oscillations, as it's called. So this third star is perturbing this binary orbit, make it eccentric, and then it drains energy and shrinks. I think that's the leading idea, but you might disagree. Yeah. Next question. Okay, Simon, then. Oh no, you're closer. <laughs> Um, I was wondering why does it why does the do the contact binaries why do they result in 30 solar mass black holes and why is it hard to make lower mass systems? So the so uh, let me put it just because it's pretty. Um, so. Um, these stars mix in part because they're deformed, but what I left out is that it's much easier for stars to mix if they're more dominated by radiation pressure than gas pressure. So the more massive stars are, the stronger radiation pressure is supporting them, and this intrinsically makes the stars already more unstable, and it helps to overcome mixing over these gradients. At least, this is the gradients in our models at the moment. So the prediction for my current models is that this crazy way of moving of these two stars shrinking, it is not going to happen below about 30 solar masses. And the window, you can only do it in super short period systems. The window for it in periods is always small, but it gets a bit wider if you go to 60 solar masses and uh, The reason why they're not more massive, in case you wonder, would be that if you are more massive, things will, at the end of their life, go undergo pulsations, which we call pulsational pair instability supernova. They share all this mass. So is that this, it will be more massive than the mass and end up to 30, 40, 45 solar mass black holes, something like that. So now Freke gets her question. She's literally just answered my question. Ah. <laughs> oh, I see. So that's the last question, causation of Ah, causation of yeah, It'll be exciting. So uh, I, I'm putting my money that this 30 solar mass black hole is actually, that we're not going to go much, but more people have said that. That the, the gap would be at 45 solar mass. Maybe this 30 solar mass is not coincidence that every of these massive things ends up there because otherwise they would have shed their mass. Um, coming back to the previous question, so but uh, you, you talked about these very special circulation motions, yeah. So there are gas motions inside the the star. Would this have uh, implications for a magnetic field? Could there be a dynamo really? pushing the, the fields there? Uh, that's an extremely interesting question. I don't think it's the case for these circulations. The circulations, the Eddington Suite itself is pla taking place on a thermal time scale, which is pretty long, I think, to build up magnetic fields. But there is a lot of, um, there is shear inside these stars. Uh, we, we, we do account to some extent for magnetic fields inside what people do, and I do as well, is what we call the uh, sprue taylor dynamo that is happening in the stars, which is a debate. That's, anyway, that will be a much longer discussion. So we do think that these rotating stars are shearing and uh, have internal ways to uh, potentially uh, at least have a way to couple themselves like magnetic fields do. Um, I don't think the circulation itself would be too long time scale. But maybe some other uh, hi. Um, do you have any thoughts on the formation of, say, thousand solar mass stars? Recently, there's been a claim of of one in a, a globular cluster. I mean, I get the impression from this these efficient three-body interactions that can kick things out. Maybe that might be hard to do through this kind of these kinds of processes. Okay, it's an incredibly exciting question that you ask. I think you're all wanting to know the answer, and the person that should be answering that is. Uh, 
<laughs> yeah, Visha knew the answer. We start when they have magically formed. And, and, and the reason I think I can do that is because we see these stars. And, uh, but going back in time, extremely interesting questions. I mean, I guess, I guess like, for example, the, the, the merger that LIGO observed, if that happened, I mean, do we know anything about the final momentum of, of this black hole? Like, do you, do you like not expect it to be in, in the galaxy anymore? I mean, like, is it highly likely that we're gonna find these things, like not where the stars are? are? Like, oh, wait, okay. I mean, okay, so I mean, like, I mean, I, I guess they're connected, but like you would kind of need to keep them like where the stars are if you're gonna continually merge things, right? Like. So the second question is black holes, different ways you can make them, but if you make them in a cluster, you probably shoot them out and travel a long way. For the evolutionary scenarios, the merger itself will happen in the galaxy, but these two black holes, they have a bit of spin before, and they merge, and they, they merge. New black hole will have a big curve around, I think it's close to 0.7. And it's been measured or inferred from the from the gravitational wave signal from last part from the ring down. Um, uh, at the same moment, uh, it's emitting gravitational waves and it's sending out also linear momentum. So the what people think that's not measured, but people think that a new black hole gets a recoil and might travel out with somewhere between 100 and 1,000 kilometers a second. So at the moment that we well, uh, it took some time for us to. Uh, to observe this wouldn't be very far. But the same story for supermassive black holes, the question is if they merge, would they stay or would they move out of their uh, environment, right? So uh, maybe what's interesting that if you merge two black holes into a one, it will be very hard for the black hole to merge another time with the black exactly, hole. Exactly. Yeah. yeah, that's gonna be very hard. The way to do that, if you do all this process inside a nuclear star cluster where a few hundred grams a second is not enough to escape, you can stay inside the nuclear star cluster. So if we find black holes in the, of 60 to 80 solar masses that are not supposed to exist because stars are not making such black holes, I would bet that if we see any signature, it should be in the center of a galaxy, right? It's the only place where I think we can do it. Well, there's something deeply wrong with our understanding of nuclear physics and explosions, but... Uh, let me also ask a question. You mentioned uh, initially when you look at 30 Doradus, you had looked at 200 O stars and 100 were in a binary system. So that means the other half is isolated and single? No, no. Okay. It was 300 O stars, 300. Yes. 100 were detected as binaries when taking seven epochs spread out. And so you will still miss binaries. So with that, it's detected binaries, and that means that basically a bit over 50% needs to have a companion because we will miss Okay, and the other ones are the probably white half, binaries. So on the other half, we call them apparently single to be safe. Uh, and uh, they may have low mass companions because there's no way we can detect them. They may have white companions because there's no way we can detect them. Uh, and in a few cases, they're runaways. And so we know, this rapidly rotating runaways, we know they were part of a binary before, right? So. Uh, but the runaways are rare, so you would expect most of the other ones are either on wide binaries or you have a companion that is much smaller in mass. Uh, there, we will be missing some closer binaries. Uh -huh. okay. so I, uh, this system has evolved a bit, so um, I, I don't know the exact numbers at the moment, but I think for, for that survey it's about 40% seems to be single and unaffected and 60% uh, from this moment on and forward will interact. But it, the closest binaries have already merged out, right? So it's slightly lower than we found in our uh, science paper, mm -hmm. in our own galaxy. Slightly lower, but it's also slightly older region. There's more single runaways, so these things are consistent. Okay. So, one more question, Christian Fendt. Thank you, this is maybe a simple question. How do you actually... How do we actually know that these are double stars? I mean, if they are two stars with the same mass, they have the same, the same spectrum, exactly the same spectrum. The only distinction is rotation, whether you have a, a, a rapidly rotating, let's say a 30 mass star, or a slow rotating, that could be probably a binary star. How do we know that this is a double? It, uh, you see the Kepler velocities of both stars. 
So they have very similar spectra, and if you would catch it at the wrong moment, or you would only have one spectrum, the, the spectra could overlap, you would not see the difference. So it's not that we see spectral lines of one class of star, another class of star, but if you take different spectra over time, at this particular moment, this one is moving away from you, and that one is moving towards you. And secondly, there's opal data of this star, and so this, this system, we don't see it really in the equator, a bit, a bit from the top, but you, you continuously see a different part of the star, either the hotter part or the cooler part. So mm -hmm. it's not really eclipsing, but you see ellipsoidal variations in the light curve that is very well known for contact lines. Good. With that, let us thank Selma again for this very nice and exciting talk.